Hey, everybody. Welcome to our football show. I'm Chris Pugh. As always, Kent Repository sports writer, Pierre Helm. Hey, Pierre, how are you doing? What's going on, Chris? Good to be back. Yeah. Well, I got first. I'm in thrilled with the high school football. I, I know Massam won, Link won, and West Branch won, right? Of the four schools left, I think Kenton South was the only school it lost, right? Yeah, and now we're down to three in um in our area so far on the now as the regional championships. Yeah, so you got Lake against uh, Maslin. Now regional championships, how many teams are left now? Is it four? Um it should be eight teams all around oh, eight. overall. Okay. Yeah, since it's the regional championship. So once once it's the regional eight, then next week is the final four or the semifinals. See- so for Star County, you got what Lake and Maslin, and who's West Branch play? Lake Mass, um, West Branch got um, oh god, who they got? Um, Jefferson area, uh, Jefferson area. Oh wow, yes. they're the one that beat Canton. Now. Okay, are, are you going anywhere this weekend? <laughs> I'll be at the Maslin. Um, I'll be at the Maslin Lake game. Me and Josh Weir are working together on that. He's going to cover the game, and I'm doing like a sidebar feature, like. I'm probably going to focus on Will Trell breaking that single season record that was held by their running backs coach, um, Travis McGuire. So I'm I'm hoping that he breaks that record and that make a good feature for um, a, yeah. a story for me to work on. Big night for Stark County football. I mean, technically, West Branch is even Stark County. So I mean, really, your championship with Stark County would be this weekend. Be kind of interesting. Um. Dan DeGeorge, who's the late coach, I went to college with him. He was a Malone pioneer. Kind of uh, mm-hmm. interesting. Tells you how old I am. I'm not sure if you <laughs> remember me or not. Um, I, knew, I knew a bunch of other football players. I never knew Dan that well. But, no, but he was a college guy uh, on the on my college team. So it was kind of interesting. Um, he was a running back. Pretty good running back for Malone, I, I would say. So, very good. Well, let's start out with Ohio State. Ohio, you know, a little nervous after last week. I mean, the weather was rough, but still Ohio mm-hmm. State only won 21-7 over Northwestern. I think, um, Peter, you and I talked about, man, can Ohio State get that statement win that they'll need? I thought they did pretty good. 56-14. What do you think? Pretty good. It was more than good. That's exactly what you want. You want yeah. to dominate bottom feeder teams and continue your undefeated streak. And that's exactly what it is. Um, I don't know how, what else to um, trans, trans by. If this is a statement win or a statement game, this was it. You beat the brakes out of Indiana. CJ Stroud was incredible. Um, five touchdowns. Um, so that's exactly what you want to continue to make an impression on the committee. And um, you want to continue to build momentum as you got these final remaining two teams, Maryland and then Michigan. So you want to chop up as many wins as you can and get those in style points. And hopefully the committee understands too that Ohio State's playing with a lot of injuries and they're still playing well. Uh, Travion Henderson, it's almost like the top two running backs take turns on who's hurt or not. Uh, this week it was Travion Henderson was out, uh, but Mayan Williams, you know, 15 carries, 147 yards. Down Hayden, you don't hear much about this guy, but he did well, 19 for 102. And then they gave the ball once to Xavier Johnson, 71-yard touchdown run. Lots of big running plays for Ohio State. Yeah, um, that just also just shows the amount of depth that Ohio State has. You know, um, that's why you even dealing with the injuries, um, especially with the receiving core losing Jack Jigba, you still got an amount of weapons and players around you that can step in and fill in that void. And it's like, Nothing has changed because you just got so many amount of talented players who are familiar with the system, even as freshmen, that they are capable of contributing right away. And you see the result of that. And I think that's more on the that's more on the um, props to the coach, coaching staff on the offensive side and, and um, Coach Day for preparing these teams or preparing for your players, especially if they're freshmen and making sure that um, – if one player goes down, you're it. So you're hopefully you're prepare for, preparing them as you um get ready for the stretch of the stretch of the season. 
Yeah, uh, Fox was at, covering the um, game. They had it on as their big uh, noon game. Uh, they had one thing I disagreed with. Like, at the end of the game, they were talking about, well, who's going to run the ball for Ohio State? And come on. I mean, uh, Ron Day said today he expects at least two of the three top backs to be back against uh, Michigan. They got depth. And, you know, I, I think they're okay. I mean, they got depth in their running game. I mean, nice if everyone's healthy, but it's not like if one guy's gone and everyone else falls. They got a lot of guys going to rock. But, yeah, you also got to take into account that they're not really too familiar with some of the freshman guys that they had. Right. Nobody would have thought that Hayden was going to go off and go over 100 yards. I mean, they will expect Mayan to do things because he got he had his moments. And so they would not expect for – a couple freshman guys or some unknown players who hasn't seen the field or get them out of carries like they have. So, of course, they're going to ask that question of who's going to be the running back in the backfield if they're not too familiar with it. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, in the passing game, um, you know, CJ Stroud, not 17 for 28, but there was flurries all day. It was cold down here in Columbus. And, you know, CJ Stroud did well, 17 for 28, 297, five touchdowns, no interceptions. I think some people expect way too much out of CJ Stroud. For a snow game, he did really well. Come on now, man. You're in Ohio. What what else are you about to see? I mean, you've been living there for a while now, so this is nothing. Why why we can continue to bring up the whole narrative with the weather when they've been doing this every day? This is nothing. So you would expect for CJ Stroud to not miss the beat. I mean, you just want him to have that Heisman moment or play to the level or the standard that you expect him to be. And this is exactly what you will want with C.J. Stroud. I'm putting up, dropping three to five touchdowns to to um, making yourself what you can do at the more higher level if you want to play in the NFL because, you rate, because you're rated that high. So it doesn't even matter what weather you play, you want to perform consistently. So I, I just try not to try to avoid the whole weather plays a plays an excuse to perform at a high level. All it does is want to make you better. Well and the weather wasn't cumbersome. I mean it was flurries, a little cold. I mean I don't think it was going to you know stop the passing game. I, I just like how Ohio State Adapts to the weather, you, you know. Um, it didn't. They didn't let weather slow them down. They, they played well, and I think it showed on the field. Um, this next week, it's going to be interesting. I think all year we've talked about this being a potential trap game. Ohio State is going to Maryland, but I'll tell you, Maryland hasn't looked too good lately. And last uh, Saturday, um, and Penn State's a good team, but Penn State won thirty to nothing over Maryland. What's happening in Maryland? Um, I think they they've been doing with their they've been doing with some injuries of their own. Um, they're also just been very inconsistent. So there's just a little combination of both. Um, with within their right. Um, so that's probably what it is. And it's just simply that Maryland is just not as good as we want expected them to be. They're I think they're exactly what we think they are. Like they're somewhere in the middle of the pack, but they're not going to be the team that's going to go over the hump. If you, if it be a a Penn State team or Ohio State or a Maryland team, so you wouldn't expect anything out of that. So I think that's probably what it is with uh, Maryland. I don't. I think they had their fair shares of injury, losing some couple guys as well. But um, you also had, uh, but um, but that also could be the case if that could be a game where. You don't expect anything likely to happen um, against Ohio State, but then what a way to respond by making it more interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. We talked about this earlier in the year. Maryland went up to Michigan, and you know we'll talk about Michigan in a minute, but Maryland came up and they played pretty well. Uh, they lost 34-27 to Michigan, but they hung around the whole game, and you know, at that time, I mean, you, you weren't thinking Maryland as a playoff team, but you talk about Maryland that was going to be maybe a pesky team that could, um, you know, give some teams fits. But, you know, after that, uh, they didn't beat Michigan State by much. They lost to Purdue at home. 
Um, they barely beat Indiana, 38-33. to um, They barely beat Northwestern, 31-24. Uh, the Northwestern game was at home uh, here, which was kind of strange. And then the last two weeks, they lost 23-10 to to Wisconsin, 30 zip to uh, Penn State. And, you know, Wisconsin and Penn State are decent teams, but, you know, they're really not the upper crest of the Big Ten at all. Yeah, um, so – Maryland got players. I think we don't want to act like they, they don't have guys that can make plays. Maryland has definitely produced talent over the years, and they will make be they will be competitive when they get a chance because they got because you got the quarterback um um Talia Tagovailoa, the quarterback. When he's in a groove, he's he probably one of the top quarterbacks in the Big Ten. You got a decent running game with um Hemby, who's at 800 yards or something like that, Roman Hemby, and he's only a freshman. And then um, one of their tough – I think it was probably because um, he was missing his top receiver, which was Raheem Jarrett. I think he left the game um, for an injury, and Tilly hasn't really looked the same after that. So they so they, they got talent, and it was just a matter of losing some marquee guys um, during – during that Penn State game, and you know, Sean Clifford played out of his mind as well. So it was just um, one of those games where they just fell flat. Um, so what will we expect the same out of the Ohio State game? You will probably think so, but I wouldn't count on Maryland after the, um, getting blanked by Penn State. I'm sure they're gonna now come in and say they got something to prove now. Well, and this is a game I. I'm not fearing as much of a like a loss letdown from Ohio State, but I think this would be a good game for Ohio State just to come in and try to take care of business. Uh, maybe if they can get up, uh, maybe some of their starters don't have to play the whole game. Um, and even if Ohio State struggles and doesn't win by a lot, I'm not sure if that's going to change what happens against Michigan. I just think this would be a good game for Ohio State to get in, do well, get out, and stay healthy. You know, so if – if you mess around and the starters have to play more, then maybe it opens up for some more injuries. Can Ohio State get in there and take care of business pretty quick? What I'm wanting to think about with Ohio State is now say that hypothetically if they do get the victory over Maryland and then you play Michigan, you know, then you got the Big Ten championship. Where does they where do Ohio State go from there? Like what would happen if they somehow do lose to Michigan, do they still get that nod as a playoff team? How far will they fall? How far will they fall in the playoff ranking standings if they lose to Michigan and they don't have an opportunity to play in the Big Ten Championship? Are they still still be in the top four? Are they, are their schedule convincing enough to get them in the top four? And that's something that is going to be very tricky when you're evaluating um, the top four teams. So that's well, my um uh, Yeah, and that's interesting. I, I think then starting with this week then, you know, that statement win is important. I don't think Ohio State has to score 200 points on Maryland. But, you know, win a game like they did last week, you know, where it's a pretty convincing win, I think that really helps. And, you know, the Northwestern game was closer than it should have been. But at least you can say, look, there was a horrible weather. Nobody was going to score a lot of points. Um, Ohio, like we said, Ohio State came back to better against Indiana. I think if they can put up maybe a 30-point win or higher against Maryland, I, I think it's going to show some good things to, to them. I, I think the hard thing is if Ohio State goes, plays Michigan, loses to Michigan, they're not in another game until – well, until the playoffs or bowl game. So I would imagine that, you know, depending on what happens in the SEC, Ohio State could have trouble making the playoff. You would almost have to expect maybe Michigan to lose the Big Ten title game. That might give Ohio State a lot better chance, would you say? Who would they lose to? There's I'm, there's no one in the I, big in the Big Ten yeah. West standing that is capable of beating Michigan. Or Ohio State, for that matter. So I don't know about that. So well, and that's why I think it might be a you know you lose your out because what well, what would be the SEC title game? If it was the SEC title game, it will likely be 
Georgia versus um, probably LSU because LSU is right there in the mix. Okay. So that makes it more that makes it more of a convenient discussion as well, if because the way LSU has been playing and they have two losses, so that will kind of mess that will kind of mess everything up now if LSU somehow beats Georgia in the SEC championship. If that comes down to that, and then you also got TCU, who's also undefeated as well. Um, can they continue? Can they finish the season undefeated? Is probably would be the question. And I think they what? Who do they play next? I think they play uh, TCU plays Texas, I believe. Or no, they beat Texas. Yeah. Um, who do they play after that? Um, but anyways, whoever do they, whoever they play, they really have to finish strong, or at least. Finish on being to stay in the conversation or stay in the rankings where they are now. Yeah, let's take a look at this. Is that it's getting pretty interesting? Uh, yeah, you're right. Um, right now it would be Georgia, LSU. Um, who does Georgia have the rest of their way schedule wise? I'm looking at now. Uh, Georgia is at home against Georgia Tech. That's a win. They actually I'm a little confused by this. I think um, Georgia I think Georgia's off this week and they play Georgia Tech next week, I think. Oh, you know what? I'm looking at the schedule wrong. I'm sorry about that, Peter. Um Georgia is actually at Kentucky this weekend. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, I see it now. Yeah. They they play Kentucky. But the Kentucky's, fu- yeah. not, Kentucky's not yeah. any good either. They're yeah, they're the f- mid at best. I mean, they lost the Vanderbilt. So uh, that's that's you. If you lose the Vanderbilt, I'm sorry, you're not that good of a team. And they have a, and they supposed to have this really good prospect quarterback and um, Will Levis is his name. Yeah, um, supposed to be like an NFL prospect, but hasn't really shown a whole lot. But at the same time, Kentucky offensive line is supposed to be horrible as well. So you expect Georgia to run to take that game, and then then you got Georgia Tech. So Afterwards, so is, is the SEC title game set now? It sounds I would, like I don't. I want to say it's completely set officially. Um, you can pretty much say that. Um, but Tennessee can still probably make a case if Georgia do lose to Kentucky, but that I don't think it would even actually want to be enough because Georgia would still take take that division because they beat Tennessee. So you can pretty much just say it is pretty much said on the SEC East side. The West side, um, I'm not really too sure about that because LSU is doing well, but Alabama's not that far behind either. So it, it, It's weird, and maybe they just said, hey, this is the way it would be if the season ended today, but the SEC um, website had it as a championship game. Like, I don't think it's said. Actually, actually, I take that back. It actually is official. LSU oh, okay. and Georgia will face each other in the championship. Because Georgia has the tiebreaker of Tennessee, right? If yeah, yeah, since they, they beat but, Tennessee, okay. It, but it, it, it's official now. LSU will play Georgia in SEC championship. Well, and here's the other thing that's interesting. Looking at TCU, that's fourth right now. Uh, TCU is at Baylor. Uh, TCU should win that game. Then they end the the regular season by hosting Iowa State. They should win that game. Um, looking at the standings right now, Kansas State is second. I would imagine they'd be favored over Kent, uh, Kansas State, you would think, in a title game. Oh, for the title game, um, TCU versus – it could be. I could see Kansas State taking that too, because um, Kansas State has been playing well, um, okay. right there. So it's still not completely cut and dry. Maybe Oklahoma State might, even though Oklahoma State has been playing poorly as the last couple of weeks, they can still somehow sneak in. But um, it's likely going to be between those two. But I think it's likely going to be Kansas State. Yeah, I'm looking at Tennessee's schedule. Uh, they're at South Carolina. And then they're at Vanderbilt. Those those are games they should win. I um, yeah. So to answer your question, I, I guess the way I'm looking at it is, I think Ohio State's going to need some help if they lose to Michigan. And 
I you're going to have to hope that Georgia falters or maybe Michigan falters in the Big Ten game, or you know a, a TCU would falter, and yeah. you know we're looking That's to schedule. The Big Ten. The the conference title is really going to be the deciding factor. It's very important, right. um, especially if Ohio State loses to Michigan. You're going to have to depend on Michigan, either not Michigan, but Michigan will be get in if they beat Ohio State. I think that's a gimme there. But you're going to have to depend on either TCU or Georgia losing in the um, losing in the conference <laughs> title or whatever kind of scenarios that you can think of. Um, and I don't even know that will be enough because they're probably – because the, the committee loves the SEC, and they're going to go with the popularity of Georgia having a chance, being that they're still the reigning champ. Even if they lose in the champion, SEC championship, they're likely still not going to fall all the way back. They're still going to be remaining in the top four. And then you're going to have to depend on likely TCU being the oddball of the conference to lose to a uh, hypothetical Kansas State, and you're hoping that Ohio State don't fall too far in the in the ranking thing or in the standings, and they move and they somehow get in and with that number four seed. So that number yeah. four seed is a magic number right there. Yeah, I, I really would think that you would need at least one of the top four, if not two of the top four, to also lose for Ohio State to have a chance to get back in it. And to your point, too, I'm looking at the Big Ten standings now. Right now, there's a four-way tie for first in the west side. Um, Illinois, Iowa, Purdue, Minnesota, Wisconsin's a game back, so they have a chance. But you're right. Which of those teams is going to be favored over Michigan or Ohio State in the Big Ten title game? Yeah, nobody. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't really see either of them beating Michigan at all. Maybe Illinois, probably. Illinois and Purdue, probably, but I don't see them. Illinois got a really good running back, but I don't even think that still would be enough to take down Michigan. It'll be interesting. Illinois at Michigan this weekend. Yeah, we'll see about that. They don't they talking about two of the top running backs in the Big Ten going 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 against each other. So we'll see who's the best running back there. So I'm looking at Purdue's schedule. Purdue does not play Michigan this year. So no. Yeah, trying to see if there's a similar team that we can compare it to. Um Purdue Beat Maryland by two, Nebraska by six. They lost to Wisconsin by 11. Man, they lost to Iowa by 21. That's not a good loss. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, no, none of them seem to be um, as good. So, man, Peter, great year for Ohio State. It comes back to, I mean, assuming things go as form, um, it'll be a barn burner next week. Uh, we'll talk about more about that next week. I mean, we got some more time to talk about, but man, it's amazing for as good as Ohio State year comes, man. It just comes down to that Michigan game. Can they get by Michigan? Mm hmm. Yeah, we'll see what happens. You know, I, I just can't believe we're already down to two, uh, just two more games, and yeah. it's really going by super quick. So. We'll see. We'll see. I th I think I wouldn't have been too worried. I think if Ohio State continue to take care of business, you know, with your win, keep winning, you're in. So there's really no else to explain it. So all I got to do is win games. Well, and, and we'll, we'll preview this game more because obviously, you know, unless something crazy happens over the weekend, this is going to be the game next week. Like I um, said, Chris, you win, you're in. Just keep winning. That's that's yeah. is as simple as that. Yeah, and I think I mean there's gonna be a lot of factors going to the game, but I think a huge one is I mean what hurt Ohio State last year was they couldn't stop Michigan's run. Uh their defense was kind of messy last year to be polite. Uh but I think their defense is better. Can they stop the run? I think they're in good shape. I mean, I think that's a big question for next weekend. We'll we'll definitely talk about it next week with the big game, but going back to like I said with Ohio State. If you win, there's nothing else, there's nothing to worry about. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, and wouldn't it be crazy? And um, again, next couple of weeks we could talk about the scenarios and everything. 
But man, um, could you imagine? I mean, obviously, Ohio State, and Michigan, Michigan can't play in the um, Big Ten championship game. But what if they end up playing again in the playoffs? I mean, that's possible. So uh, crazy times. Um, it brings back memories too. I know Peter, you're relatively new to the Ohio area. Did you know that Ohio State and Michigan played in a one-two game recently? In a one-two game, what do you mean? Uh, when one was ranked one against number two. A couple years ago? Yeah, I think it was the year. Yeah, 2006. I, um, oh, that was a while ago. Yeah. Oh. Game I was, was a, That was what? About what, 16 years ago? I was probably yeah. still in middle school. <laughs> I was probably in middle school when that happened. Yeah, I called the game of the century. Troy Smith was the quarterback for Ohio State. Uh, didn't do much in the um, pros. He ended up winning the Heisman Trophy. I love he, Troy Smith. Yeah, and then Michigan. Uh, Chad Henney was their quarterback. He was still in the oh, NFL yeah. until last year, I believe. And their defense was anchored by Lamar Woodley, a former Pittsburgh Steeler. How about that? Wasn't Jake Long a left tackle as well? I think so. The Arkham Green doesn't. Because Jake Long mention. and Chad Henney were teammates in Michigan. I definitely remember that. Some of Miami yeah. Dolphins fan. So I would know those two were teammates at one point in Michigan. Some other guys you might remember, uh, Ted Ginn Jr. Uh, was a receiver on the Daddy. Buckeyes. Yeah. Uh, Mike Mike Hart was Michigan's um, running back. Uh, now he's a running back coach. <laughs> yeah. Crazy, Malcolm bro. Jenkins. Yeah, Malcolm Jenkins was a longtime NFL cornerback. He played for Ohio State. Mario Manningham was a big receiver for uh, Michigan. James Laronitis, uh, he's now a – uh, coach in Notre Dame. He was a linebacker for Ohio State. Beanie Wells yeah. and Brandon yeah. Graham. So, yeah. Uh, it, quite a game. Ohio State ended up winning the game 42-39. to 39. It was uh, crazy. So, yeah, we'll see. A lot more talk next week about Ohio State, Michigan. Uh, but we got some pro football to talk about. Um, we usually don't talk about the Dolphins, but the Dolphins have been playing a lot of AFC North teams uh, this year. And, man, uh, Miami continues to impress, Peter. I was really looking at this game as another test for Miami to say, hey, this is a game you can win, and you can win pretty handily uh, if you want to show you're a contender. And they did that. What was the final? I think it was, what, 39 to 17, I believe? Um, I believe so. Something like that. Yeah, and – Miami looked good. It was interesting. Um, you know, you would think, wow, they scored 39 points. The big guys had big games. Oh, they just produced all over the place. It really wasn't one or two guys that did it for them. Well, for one thing, they clean Browns couldn't stop anybody. I think we could yeah. just probably start off with that. Um, I think we really know that running right, the, the Cleveland Browns are terrible against the run. I think we kind of saw that when they played the Chargers. That was that last rushing. And the Miami Dolphins was ranked, what, 24, 20, no, like 27th. They're a bottom tier in rushing going into that game. And then they put up, um, they put up like over 100 yards on Cleveland Browns. So that was definitely uh, a stepping stone for the for the Dolphins, for that matter, because of Jeff Wilson and Raheem Mostert doing well. And um, Tua Tagovailoa played outstanding. Another perfect, almost daily perfect game. You know, three three touchdowns. Um, he was making throws from all over the place. Um, so definitely uh, an impressive win on the Dolphins side. Very bad for the Cleveland Browns side. Well, know, let's, we just, let's finish up with Miami because there are some interesting numbers. Uh, yeah, two had a really good game, 25 for 32. Uh, very accurate, uh, which was impressive. Uh, Most accurate quarterback in the league. Yeah, and if you look at it, I mean, his stats were good, not eye-popping. Um, you look at the receivers. You know, we always talk about how Waddle and Tyreek Hill are their two main guys. I'll tell you, their top receiver, Waddle, only had 66 passing uh, receiving yards. Uh, Mike Koscicki, 31 yards. Uh Tyree killed 44 yards, and they still scored 39. It, it's telling you that they have a more 
they're getting well rounded too. It's not just care about one or two guys. That's, that's more of on the that's more of a look on Tua talk about look, finding guys open, you know, because yeah. Tua has just been excellent when it call when it comes to his pocket presence, his anticipation, just finding the open guys and throwing it the ball where it needs to be, where not even the clean Browns DB can't even reach it. There was even one, t- there was even one touchdown um, to, uh, it was Sherfield in the end zone. It was just beyond beauty because it was really right where it needed to be. Not even, not, no DB could even get to that. So Tua Tagovailoa, he Tua Tagovailoa is playing at an MVP type year. I think he's probably the guy that might give Patrick Mahomes a run for his money. Um, but yeah, Tua is definitely playing remarkably well, and the Miami Dolphins are playing remarkably well so far. And they got a bye week, so they are gem- they're gonna enjoy this um, off week momentum and get back to work when they play Houston next week. Yeah, you know they can rest up. It'll be good. Um, Interesting, and you know, we talked about this last week. And I'm not ripping on Raheem Mostert at all. I mean, he's playing well. They trade for Jeff Wilson, and I'm thinking, man, will he start? Will he get a lot of touches? Holy cow, he's looked really impressive. He had 17 for 119 rushing um, against the Browns for a touchdown, also caught a couple passes for 24 yards. And it's not that Raheem Mostert's not playing, he eight carries 65 yards. But man, you've got that one-two combination that's really impressive now. It's, it's the complimentary of Mike McDaniel's scheme because he knows those two. They're both 49ers guys. Yeah. So that's more a reflection on that because they know his scheme so well. Um, Jeff Wilson's the guy who's gonna give you those hard yards because he's just an angry runner, kind of like a mini Nick Chubb, and uh, which we we're gonna talk about later. Um, yeah. And then Raheem Moster is the guy that you want to get him those long home run yards. You know he's the because he got because he got that speed. He's I think he was I think he runs like what what was the what was the stat? I think he ran like twenty five miles per hour or something like that because he's a sprinter. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so yeah, that's what you expect from Raheem Moster because he's that speed guy that will just outrun you when he finds an open lane and Jeff Wilson is the guy who's going to give you those tough yards you know run downhill and break tackles so that it's the combination of both of them there's not necessarily a a primary runner or more like a who is going to get the most touches it was just more on the who has the hot hands and Jeff Wilson clearly had the hot hands that can get but you look at Miami, and, you know, Miami's in first place, too. You know, we always look at, you know, the AFC East saying, well, it's got to be Buffalo and some of the teams behind them. Man, you know, Buffalo, I, I want to talk about that game if we have time, because that Buffalo game was insane. Um, but, man, right now Miami's at the top. Man, you look at the AFC East. I'll be honest with you, Pierre. I didn't think everybody in the AFC East would do well. You got four teams right now that are all above 500. You know, Miami's 7-3. Jets and Bills are six and three. Patriots are five and four. It's been a really impressive league. Yeah, um, this could be a possible chance. You might see three AFC East teams in the playoffs. That could be a possibility. Um, and this Sunday, the Jets play the New England Patriots. That's going to be something interesting to watch. Um, yeah. The Cleveland Browns play the Buffalo Bills. So that's that would have been the perfect segue right there. You know, after Buffalo Bills coming off a crucial loss to the Minnesota Vikings. Hard ending. So, yeah, but um, going back to your point, the AFC East, is this is a big year for them. This is something that you would expect from the AFC West, but you just pretty much one-sided with the Kansas City Chiefs. But, um, yeah, this was definitely a big, big year for the um, AFC West. And you might ask, hey, well, you know, the Dolphins aren't in the AFC North. Well, the Ravens and the Bengals are off this week, so we're kind of focusing on a couple other things. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about the Browns. Man, three and six. I mean, I think I would be shocked if people really expected a lot more than what they're doing right now. But still, three and six just is really disappointing. Yeah, um, you would thought that 
after that first play when Jacoby Brissett made that big throw to um, who was it, Donald Peoples Jones, I believe, mm-hmm. on the first play, you think that okay, the Cleveland Browns they're gonna play competitively, and they really haven't. You know, something just they just weren't executing. Um, Miles Garrett was nowhere to be found. I mean, he got. I mean, he was going against an all-pro left tackle and Taron Armstead. Um, so they were not able to get to Tua. There was no pressure um, defensively, and they couldn't stop the run, which was always been an issue for the Browns. Um, offensively, Nick Chubb, probably one of his worst games, if not his worst games of the season, and that's more on hit numbers-wise. Um, he probably – he – went below 100 yards and he also fumbled on one of those plays on, on one of in one of the plays and um, that was really crucial so Nick Chubb didn't really had his have his game as well and Jacoby Brissett um he did what he can but it was just really not enough to if you're gonna if you want to win games depending on Jacoby Brissett that you already lost uh it, it was just really unbalanced you could say and which is a matter of they were just out of it after the second quarter no they were out of it after the third quarter when Jeff Wilson made that big run that that was it for them so the Cleveland Browns is just continue to fall back where you can and you wouldn't expect that being that they still have talents all over that you thought it was going to be more more convincing game but right, so right now that they're just not clicking right now it's just not working for them what do you think it is with nick chubb because uh peter you know stefanski hasn't used him a lot over his whole tenure with the browns freddie kitchens the guy one of the old browns coaches didn't use him that much is nick chubb someone you can't use 20 25 30 carries a game i mean are we all missing something because i mean each week we like why aren't they running Nick Chubb more? And they don't run Nick Chubb more. I mean, is it Nick Chubb not a heavy duty runner? I mean, maybe are we all missing something here? Or what's no, 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 no. It's, it's not like that at all. He is cap- We we all know what Nick Chubb is capable of doing. It's just, I think it was right after that fumble, they it was just not working for them. The running game wasn't working in general. That was just pretty much the issue. Because the Miami Dolphins did a good job containing him and stopping him, so there were so Stefanski. I, I mean, they weren't really want to lean towards the running game if it's not working. And yeah. but unfortunately, Nick Chubb is your best player. He's your best option right now. Um, so I don't want to go as far as say it's their not leaning towards him now. It's just a matter of the running game was just not working right now. They got a they needed a spark and they needed to make big plays right away if they want to stay in the game. Uh I think that's just probably what it is. Well and I look at Mari Cooper too. I know you receivers can't always have a hundred yards every game. But man, if you be a team like Miami, somebody from the offense has got to pop. I mean some has got to really do well. Mari Cooper, three for 32. Uh, Donovan Peoples Jones had a good game. He was five for 99 receptions. But, but that man, was from that big, that was from that big, that big um, passing. That was pretty much a chunk of it. After that, they haven't really done much. Right. And if you're going to beat the Dolphins, come on, Mari Cooper. I mean, you can't have 150 yards every game. I know life doesn't work that way. But I mean, if you're going to beat the Dolphins, somebody's got to pop, and, and no one well, seems to. For the he Browns. did win against win against a pretty good corner in Xavier Howard. So, I, I, right. I, so the defense, the Miami Dolphins defense, did a good job um, preparing against the Cleveland Browns team. They know that if they made they made the Cleveland Browns a one dimensional team, that was probably would have been a game plan for them. If I'm the defensive coordinator. Um, make them a one-dimensional team. Don't make them an all-around balanced team like we saw against the Cincinnati Bengals. If you can shut down their run, then and make Jacoby Brissett throw like over 30, 35 game. I mean, thirty-five, um, on thirty-five passes, you have a chance because you have a really solid pass defense. So if you make them more one-dimensional, if you can somehow take out Nick Chubb, you have a chance, and that's exactly what it did. 
Uh, tune into our Steelers podcast later. We'll talk more about the Steelers. They won 20 to 10. And Pierre, I'm not even sure how much there's to say about the game. Uh, the Saints are bad, man. I, I mean, they did not look good at all. And I think the Steelers, uh, TJ Watt came back. Uh, TJ Watt's not, he didn't have a, a big TJ Watt game, but just the fact that TJ Watt played really changed matchups on the defense. It freed up some more guys and everything. The Steelers didn't have Minka Fitzpatrick, but just having T.J. Watt, Mel Watt, uh, their running game, which has been junk all year, actually got over 200 yards against the Saints. I think they're playing a little bit better, but I think part of it was the Saints were just bad. So, I mean, hey, the Steelers broke their losing streak. Anytime the Steelers wins a good day, but ugh. You think I, that's bad? Wait till you play next for this Sunday when they play. The Indianapolis Colts with Jeff Saturday's the head coach. Well, that's actually the following Monday. Uh, this Sunday, Monday. Uh, yeah, Steelers will play the Bengals at home. It'll be interesting. Uh, Bengals doesn't they don't expect to have Jamar Chase there? Steelers actually beat the Bengals during the year for as hard as it is to imagine. Uh, Bengals should win that game. It'll be interesting to see if the Steelers can keep it competitive. Um, I mean, you got TJ Watt back. Uh, Minka Fitzpatrick had an appendix out. I don't think he's playing, uh, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see if they can make it competitive. I, I think the Bengals win the game, but I'm hoping for a Steelers safety they don't get blown out. So we'll see. You know, when, when it comes to divisional games, you expect it to be um, competitive anyway. Mm-hmm. So um, though, I wouldn't expect anything, especially you're playing at you're playing at home. Um, Kenny Pickett is starting to get better. You can say that you see the confidence and the growth of him. So you just hope that he continues that, you know, and the Bengals, I mean, they've been dealing with their fair shares of injuries on the defensive side. So you want to capitalize on that. Um, but so well, it's Joe Mixon. And then you also got Joe Mixon who has been playing well. So, yeah. so, so right. you'll, you'll see. So we'll see how it was going to look. And it's, it's also good to have TJ Watt back, but, um, that also is going to major have a major boost, but also you also have like Alex Highsmith on the opposite end, who's one of the top sack leaders. So that also helps that you have both premier pass rushers that can somehow get to um Joe Burrow. Yeah, and then Carolina goes to Baltimore, <laughs> which probably would be a Baltimore win, I would imagine. That. So be interested to see what happens there. Um, couple real quick things. Um. Yeah, it's funny. Um, some reporting in the Akrabika Journal. Uh, apparently, there's some snow headed in Northeast Ohio, and how that affects the Browns. The Browns are going to Buffalo. They say maybe two feet of snow. Are they going to move that game, or are we, are we going to have a nice, big, fun snowball on Sunday in Buffalo? I, I'm rooting for a snowball. I think it's going to be fun. Oh, man. It's. I don't know. I. <laughs> It, it's I don't even know how to really answer that, you know. Um, nobody wants to. Play. I don't even know that's actually a fun. I I don't know. I can't speak for the players, um, but playing at a a snow, I think it was like twenty feet or something like that, or higher. Like dealing with blizzards over there in Buffalo, ain't no talent. Um, so there could be a. It wouldn't surprise me if they have to relocate if the blizzards work. Is worse than what it looks. Um, so it would have surprised me. Didn't that happen before that they have to play like in Detroit or something like that? Because, well, they actually had, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, internet. I remember this game uh, back in 2007, Peter. Uh, Browns beat the Bills in Buffalo eight to nothing. Um, but oh. it was, it was the old kicker, Phil Dawson. Um, he kicked a 49 yard field goal, uh, which was crazy. Um, it was a huge snowstorm, and then they all they played another snow game in Buffalo. Uh, Browns won six to three. Um, Billy Cundiff, who was their kicker at the time, kicked an 18 yard field goal in the final minute of the game. So, let's play snow. I mean, let's snow, man. But, when, 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 like, but how bad would uh? I'm not saying that it will happen, but when the last time 
they have to relocate or play at another site because of a snowstorm. Was that brutal? I think they moved the game to the, uh, in Buffalo to Detroit because of snow. I'm not sure what the arrangement was. Uh, let me look this up. Uh, weather games are fun to watch, man. Oh, I, I'm seeing here AccuWeather.com estimate as much as six feet of snow in the yeah, Buffalo it, area. It's, wow. it's, pretty, it's pretty bad from what I saw too. So yeah, that's why that's why I'm asking you if it's really if it's really um. If it's really brutal, then there could be a possibility they might have to relocate. But it's not um, looking good in Buffalo. Uh, the story I'm reading here, it was uh, pub this afternoon. Uh, the NFL spokesman says the league is mirroring the weather. They've been in contact with, two cl- with both clubs. They're saying uh, he's not saying if the league is considering moving the game out of Buffalo. Uh, there's some talk that maybe it gets postponed uh, to Monday or Tuesday. Oh, oh, so, and, and that's according to NFL spokesman Ooh. Brian McCarthy. So, Ooh. very interesting. All right, sounds good. So, yeah, football is getting really interesting. Uh, NFL is, um, you know, really going into the playoff run. College football, um, you know, this is kind of like the last breath we could take, uh, for those that like the Ohio State Buckeyes until next week, where it all comes down. Where it's uh, Buckeyes, Michigan, and we'll see what happens there. Um, and then high school football. Hey, if you're into that, um, the rounds of eight this weekend. And if you're in Stark County, uh, Peter Holland and Josh Weir are going to be at the Lake Massa game, which is going to be a fun game to watch if you're a Stark County football fan. Lots of football, yeah. people, man. Uh, good week to be a football fan. Yeah, we're really going to the final stretch of it. Um... It's going by really fast. Um, Maslin and Lake will be at Parma, so we're going to be at Byer Stadium. Um, yeah, 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 I know. I know what you're thinking. Come on. I know, I know what you're thinking. Um, probably, I, should probably say, I should probably tell you the reason. I probably won't say it on air, but there okay. is a reason behind that, um, and it probably might have to do on more on Maslin's side. Um, oh, but maybe the number of fans. It's it, but even so, it would have made better sense to me to have it locally, um, even have it at Benson Stadium because you don't have to use it until it's the state championship. But I don't know. There's some kind of there's still kind of a a conflict with certain county team, some of the area area schools wanting to host, you know. Or it's just a lot, there's there's a lot of politics that goes into it. What I could probably tell you after. Well, what would make more sense is maybe Infosys is the same or University of Akron plays, because I remember. And again, I'm an old guy. I haven't lived in Star County for a long time, but I remember watching a Massa McKinley playoff game at Infosys the same. It's big enough to have a lot of people there. I don't know, man. Maybe another game was there that weekend, or they were doing something else. Who knows? Um, yeah, so it should be fun. Um, Peter, so what else are you working on other than preparing for the big massive leg game? What can we read from you in the Canton repository? Um, that's pretty much that's pretty much what we've been focusing on. Um, don't really have a lot going on. Um, I've been just been keeping track with recruiting. Um, basically, um, a lot of the, a lot of the Maslin players are getting some pretty good looks. Um, Ardell Banks. Recently, just visited Kentucky over the weekend. I wrote something about that, along with um, others, other stuff about Maslin as well about their defense. Uh, Ardell Banks got offered by Kentucky. He got offered by Cincinnati, so he's getting some pretty good looks. And there was another player named Nolan Davenport, who six foot six tight end, and he's getting and got offered by Pittsburgh, and he's only a sophomore. So I've just been keeping. I'm just trying to keep track with recruiting and probably build like uh we're also trying to build our own little uh st- our own county team our all county team as well but that's probably going to be to, right toward the end of the season so that's probably what we're going to be working on at also right now other than the playoffs yeah check out my work um i i write for pr daily uh, it's a national public relations um 
publication. Um, lots of fun current event stuff I'm writing about, Peter. Uh, today, uh, Walmart had their opioid settlement. Um, uh, the how do I say this? Um, New York, their attorney general is saying that. Because of the way Walmart and some other drug places handled opioid uh, prescriptions, that led to the opioid crisis. Um, so they're getting some money back from some of these companies. So I talked about their settlement. Uh, there's a country, um, an island country, that's almost being submerged by climate change. So they want to go to the metaverse. I uh, talked about that. And then also recently, Elon Musk, I uh, get mm. this, man. Someone criticized that worked for Twitter, Elon Musk, in a Twitter post. Uh, he was going back and forth with Elon on Twitter. Elon's like, you're out of here. Oh, yeah, wow. so, so don't make fun of your boss on social media, especially if it's a boss of a big tech company. Uh, that's mm. less learned there, man. Tell that to all the millions of people that have been calling him out. Yeah. I mean, yeah <laughs> it's ridiculous, man. Well, and I've been very critical of Elon in some recent uh, columns I wrote for PR Daily, so I, I, I probably have lost my chance to have to work at Twitter. <laughs> I'm sure if, they, <laughs> if they're tracking my Twitter mentions, they're, I'm probably out. So who knows? All right, all right. Well, appears as always, this has been good. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to a good football weekend. I, I like this. I, I don't like being out in the cold here, but if I can just stay inside, stay warm. Uh, I, I got the cable channels. I can watch some good football every weekend. I'm looking forward to it. Aren't you lucky? Because I'm the one who's going to be out in the cold on Friday. Ah. So. <laughs> I'm the one who's got to drive all the way up in Parma. So. I, I started my career as a sports writer. I remember... Uh, what was it like eight years ago? I managed a group of newspapers in uh, the Mansfield area, and uh, we had a small staff. I had one news writer and one sports writer, so I I stepped in, man, because I wanted to cover football again. So I said, "Hey, buddy, I'm going to cover one of our area teams. You cover one of our area teams." I went for the first couple of weeks. It was so much fun, Peter, because it was nice. It was warm outside. It was fun, and then probably it was like week four or five of the year. Very cold, very rainy. I'm like, screw this. I'm not. <laughs> yeah. I told my uh, sports writer, hey, we're only going to cover one game from now on. You go cover it. I'm too cold. So <laughs> I don't like the cold, man. Uh, it's rough. You're a fellow Ohioan, and you don't like the, like the cold. That's yeah. ironic. That's very yeah, yeah. ironic. Yeah, I'll cover, I'll cover basketball. I mean, it's inside. I mean, you're cold when you go outside, but, you know, it's warm inside, so it's good. All right. Well, Peter, as always, thanks for your time. Right, again, everyone, check out our show. Check out our sponsors. It's right on the um, podcast page. And check us out next week. We'll be uh, talking about the next upcoming batch of games. Uh, for Peter, this is Chris. Have a great night, everybody. Hi, I'm Jennifer Mooney. Welcome to what is our new Hope Interrupted podcast based on the work from our book, Hope Interrupted, that I co-authored with my good friend, Byron McCauley. Hey, Jennifer. You know, I'm looking forward to this podcast as much as I was look, looking forward to writing this book with you. We hope to interview some uh, high-impact folks as well as have a little fun. We're going to cover stories of hope. To learn more about our podcast and our book, please visit www.hopeinterrupted.com.